I am delighted to be here and have a chance to celebrate the humanities in a city that I think has valued every aspect of them, from literature to drama to architecture and the arts. Now, there's been an oppositional tenor to the study of the humanities, especially in the United States. This began in American universities in the 1950s. I'd like to take a different stance today and encourage all of us to look more closely at everything around us, including places like amusement parks. Here is Coney Island, for instance, uh, or movie theaters. The ordinary environment of the world around us and ask questions about history and about the present day. Now, this early phase of the humanities and scholarship sought to assert an alternative to the science and technology and market-driven ideas about knowledge and progress that dominated American universities and, indeed, the larger culture. The humanities instead celebrated timeless scholarship and artistic masterpieces and great books, as many universities call them, that were in principle universal and transcendent. These unequivocal high points of our human creativity supposedly had nothing to do with market value, usefulness, or the present day. But even stronger was a visceral disdain for American mass culture, and especially for television. Uh, Dwight McDonald castigated it as lowbrow, facile, and mindless. And not surprisingly, most American scholars were adamantly Eurocentrist. That is, they disliked almost everything that was produced in the United States far more than most visiting Europeans did. Uh, there was a sense of terror, if not uh, uh, simply disdain, about the world of American culture and especially of popular culture. Now, one of the things I love about Chicago is you've always had a different attitude about elite culture and about popular culture. You're knowledgeable about the city's history, about the different neighborhoods, and about the diverse population, not just the artistic and intellectual elite. And a pervasive fascination with this city's architecture is one of the reasons for this collective pride. Now, I share these emotions. I was born in Chicago at Passivant Hospital, and my grandmother and my daughter both went to the U of C. And my dissertation and first book were about Chicago, about the changes from Victorian ornaments on ordinary houses to more simplified kinds of houses. And I juxtaposed not only what architects wanted to do to change the way architecture for houses looked, but also what these ordinary builders and carpenters and masons and reform groups and women's groups wanted to do. They had a similar aesthetic, but for very different reasons. Now, all of this is part of Chicago's pragmatist approach to ideas. That's not the merely pragmatic, that is just getting something done. It's the philosophy that John Dewey at the University of Chicago and others put forward a century ago insisting that there are diverse perspectives. There's not just one truth. And there are provisional answers. We know something for a basis for asking other questions. And changing circumstances. Something can look different in one place or another. It's a distinctly American philosophy. They asked as well, what do our ideas do in the world? And I think it's something very important for us in the aftermath of the election to be thinking about what the ideas that were discussed on both sides will do. How do we take up the kinds of questions we now have to face? This poses an important challenge for humanists and for architects as well. Because we now have come around to acknowledging that history can open new dimensions about the present day. It can give us insights about problems. We don't have to avoid dealing with the present in order to try to, uh, to be as scholarly as we want. One eminent philosopher observed, garbage is garbage, but a history of garbage is scholarship. 
And we in, in the Northeast actually saw this last week when Hurricane Sandy came through. It pushed people to get beyond having small debates about global warming, about infrastructure, about the various parts of New York and what might happen in the future. Suddenly, we had to deal with the history, both long-term and recent, of all of these problems and talk about what to do. And so that discussion is hopefully now leading to some answers, some ways of responding, and responding in multiple ways to what will surely happen again. Now, we in history detectives call this the so what factor. <laughs> that is, we'll do an investigation. We'll, un we'll work at understanding what happened as close as we can come in the past. But one of the things we always try to have underneath the surface there is to have that be a way to pose questions about something in the present day. Um, we don't tell people what to think. We want them to take this up. For instance, we've done a number of stories about government deception. Did you know, for instance, that 9-11 was not the first foreign attack on American soil? During World War I, before we entered the war, there were 42 German attacks on munitions depots. One of them was on a place that no longer existed after the attack. It was called Black Tom Island um, in New Jersey, just off the coast. Um, and it actually blew out all of the windows of lower Manhattan. It, it demolished Ellis Island, um, the, 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 the station there for, for immigrants. All of the barges of would-be immigrants sank and people drowned. And yet Wilson knew about this within a day or two and he refused to acknowledge that it was a German attack because he was running on a platform of, I kept this out of war. Mm -hmm. And exactly, yeah, you're, you're laughing, you're totally right, that this is what happens all too often in politics. And we have many ways in which this is part of our history that we want people to say, you know, that's just like the way so-and-so is dealing with uh, with, with problems in the present day, and rather than simply withdrawing or withdrawing into only listening to MSNBC or Fox News, to have people become more vigilant. In the same way, we did a story about Tokyo Rose, and I had been taught that this was uh, a, uh, a woman who had turned against America and who was trying to, uh, to, to make American sailors uh, lose confidence in their side and believe that their wives and girlfriends were running off with other men. But in fact, it was all concocted by the Attorney General, Tom Clark and J. Edgar Hoover, who felt that Americans needed a new enemy in the aftermath of the war. So they staged the whole thing. And I felt very proud of us doing investigations that are in part intended to get people to say, you know, that's what's happening with these press releases, or that's what's happening with this position uh, that is coming through either the White House or a particular uh, candidate. And how can we encourage people to become more vigilant, to take these issues up. This isn't to suggest that history tells us what to expect, much less what to do in the present, as if there were coherent cycles. It's more accurate to say history is a conversation with the past about the future. Now, good humanists always acknowledge their sources, so I'll admit that my former husband came up with that eloquent phrase. And television, well, I was told that going on television would ruin my academic career. But in fact, it made me be a much better teacher. It encouraged me to have a discussion with students, even in a large auditorium, rather than simply filling the empty vessels with knowledge. Um, I wanted to learn what students of a gener different generation than me thought about ideas. I wanted them to think more actively and to challenge each other with different ideas in a way that television encourages us to do. And attitudes change as well. I think now, 10 years after the program began, there is a difference. If conservative humanists of a generation ago saw cultural dichotomies of great 
uh, textual analysis versus somewhat deceptive visual culture or high versus popular culture or a glorified past versus a degraded present, today we tend to think in terms of spectrums and hybrids. It's much more fluid. In fact, in the last decade or so, some humanists have taken on topics in popular culture that would have been totally unthinkable even a decade ago. Romance novels or The Sopranos or Top Chef, uh, they're, they're looking at what ordinary people see on television, what they see in advertising, what they read on the subways, and trying to understand the nature of the appeal. Now, admittedly, this sometimes leads to a rather uh, silly and superficial academic performance. It can be just one other version of, uh, of scholarship that is um, uh, playing with ideas in the public as opposed to really engaging them and trying to understand. And even now, there are many scholars and artists who proudly announce that they don't even own a television. They define their taste and their status more in terms of what they look down upon than what they can appreciate and create and learn from. But I think that the humanities are ultimately about this openness of all of us who create, all of you and me making television and the people who are artists and musicians in our culture, the people who are writers and scholars, all of us learning from and challenging each other. History Detectives affirms my belief that Americans are intelligent and want to be challenged, at least a large number of them. So we shouldn't get discouraged by the ones who don't fit in that category. I'd like to connect that with architecture tonight because I, I try to move myself between these two fields and it's a juxtaposition that tells us a lot about how History Detectives works as a show, a very distinctive show that's unlike anything else that's been on television, but also why architecture was a frequent topic, and it's an important method for analyzing our larger culture. Now, we have examples like Luna Park that we just saw. We also have examples that I've dealt with that are physical objects that are buildings ranging from Yankee Stadium here on your left to a tiny stadium called Pop Lloyd Field. I don't know if any of you are, are baseball buffs uh, and know about Pop Lloyd, who was the person who created the position of shortstop. Um, and he played in the Negro League in Atlantic City. And this was a small stadium uh, that was built by the political boss. And it was in a black neighborhood. And in many ways, shows the difference between these two worlds of baseball, the two neighborhoods or cities that they were part of, uh, and the ways that we can look at the objects and immediately see in them something about those larger conditions. Now, every one of our segments starts with an object or a building, a thing, an American thing that is related to our history, uh, and a person who has a question about it. The history that we analyze is recorded in these objects and buildings. Whether they seem extraordinary or ordinary, they tell us fascinating stories that might otherwise be difficult to sort out. Architecture is a potent leitmotif for this because either one of these buildings encompasses every kind of influence. Economic, how much money did it cost to build something? Social and cultural and political. Who put up the money? Who approved it? Who passed the laws that decided what kinds of zoning would be in effect? Um, we can see a variety of concepts about beauty, about an audience, about who the public is, about who will be uh, welcomed into a certain place. It is a way of looking at the people who design and imagine buildings, about those who commission, finance, and construct them, those who work in factories and office buildings and fast food joints, the people who live in every kind of dwelling, and even those who just walk down the street and might look up, can they tell if something is a church? Can they tell if they'd be welcome into that building? Are they impressed or are they horrified by what they see? It lets us look at all of these dimensions without being overwhelmed 
It's not as if somebody would say, wait, you were just talking about how much money this building cost, and now you're talking about who commissioned it. All of that makes sense coming together in an object or a building. And I think that's part of what is the genius of the show, why it works, why we can deal with these varieties of history. And it's one of the reasons I encourage all of you to build upon this great tradition in Chicago of being interested in architecture, because it does bring these various kinds of history together. Now, I've done shows about iconic places like Coney Island and the Waldorf Astoria Hotel and Yankee Stadium, but I've also done darker places, like a Nazi POW camp in Texas, or a home for unwed mothers who came through the Kansas City Railway Station when this, was, when this city was the center of both women giving birth and families who wanted to adopt babies through Roe v. Wade in the 1970s. Kansas City was where most of this happened. We've done many houses, too. Uh, one house was, uh, uh, was purportedly a place where a woman who had been burned in the Salem witchcraft trials uh, had lived, and the owner asked us to find out if that story was true or not. There's another that was actually a group of 200 houses uh, called Leisureamas that were based upon that house where Nixon and Khrushchev had the famous Moscow debate about American life and appliances. The houses, too, were part of Cold War propaganda. Well, History Detectives shows us how historians think. And as a result, many teachers and university professors like the show, as do other professionals. My intern says, it's like diagnosis, I love it, <laughs> that it's a matter of knowledge and experience and close observation and then speculating and reminding yourself to question your own first assumption. Because he knew, as a good diagnostician, what all of us know. It's awfully easy to only find evidence that supports our first idea, as opposed to trying to take another position. The audience for this show is about a million households right now, much larger than for any book I'll ever write. It's also surprisingly diverse, and that to me is one of the most profound changes uh, that the Chicago Humanities Festival has picked up on, uh, that the humanities are now a way of looking at diverse kinds of creativity and experience and hunger for ideas. It's not simply the work of a limited number of people. Um, I've loved the fact that every time I've come to Chicago, bellboys, for instance, will run out of hotels and say, I love your show. I just, it makes me really happy that there are people who are my colleagues, who are professionals, who are educated middle class people, all of them find it exciting. I have to admit, as a New Yorker, it was hard at first to have these people I didn't know. Oh, Gwen, I love you. I don't know you. Get away. This would be difficult. But I had to learn to take on a different demeanor as a way of following through on my desire to get them to engage more strongly um, in doing what I do. I really try to challenge them to say, can't you see? Can't you figure out what is going on? Can't you look at that document? Can't you notice this? I try to wait a beat so that the audience will actually beat me to the punch. Well, to my mind, we're now, we've just finished showing our 10th season, and there are seven basic principles about History Detectives I'd like to share with you, in part because there are things that you do but could become more self-conscious of, and there are things that are fundamental about architecture as well. One of them is looking closely. Now, this is a picture of me looking at this uh, purported witch's house and trying to date it myself. But we always insist on bringing in several different people. There's no one expert who knows everything. And so in this instance, we also had a dendrochronologist do a study of the rings in the uh, major timbers of the center of the house and discovered that it was built after the witchcraft trial, so it could not have been part of that. So we emphasize our our respect for what these different experts know, but we also try to open up their methods. That is, I'll stop and ask somebody, now how did you know that? Show me, and I'm trying to speak for the audience in that way. And it becomes important, I think, for all of us, not so much to 
to, to be disdainful or hold back from various kinds of experts, but to try to understand what it is they're doing, to become more active and take this up uh, ourselves. Now, as an example, several years ago, I did a story about a house in the Denver suburb of Daniel's Gardens. Uh, the basement ceiling was really bizarre. It was the undercarriage of some kind of train car. And the couple who owned it wanted to know, what was this? What had gone on? I, I learned, first of all, that this neighborhood had been a working class neighborhood that was settled from 1937 through uh, the early 1950s. And these were people who didn't have much money and who therefore often made their houses the way people do in shanty towns, out of scrap over time. And then I learned there was a clue from this sign only that the trolley cars in Denver had been taken out of commission in 1948, just after World War II, and were sold as scrap for $100. So a lot of people who were caught in this severe housing crisis bought a trolley car and used it as a house and then added on to the trolley car. And this was the instance of what had happened. So it was a matter of combining a history of a disastrous transportation policy, uh, of doing away with public transit, and the ingenuity of these people who didn't have much money and didn't have a place to live and figured out a way to take care of themselves at least for a short time. The second principle is that of research. Our research emphasizes the critical importance of libraries and archives. We show people how to use these precious places and assure them they'll be welcomed, at least in most public libraries. Now, one of the things that was important in doing this work, for instance, uh, I'm, here I am in, a, in an archive doing work about this poploid field. And in the archive, I came across some documents that showed how much this little field had cost. And I looked at that and, and turned to my producer, who you see here, and I said, this is impossible. This is two or possibly three times what this little building could have cost, even in 1949. So my bet is there's some graft somewhere. And then the guy who was running the archive said, you know, it's interesting, this construction company did all the work for the city. <laughs> well, you're from Chicago, you know <laughs> what all that means, right? <laughs> And that is exactly what happened. So the political boss um, was actually on retainer for the construction company. He made, he made money with every job they got. And they then split this difference between what they were paid and what it actually cost. And he got this vote and stayed in office. So we can find ways of looking at all that, plus talking about Pop Lloyd and the history of the Negro League. And nobody says, hey, wait a minute, because having the place or the object, the thing, the American thing, allows us to bring all these different elements together. Now, the third is that research will always bring up some contradictory evidence, um, which doesn't necessarily mean lies or distortions. It means different points of view. Now, this raised probably, for me, the greatest dilemma that I faced in the history of history detectives. That was in the very first season when we were figuring out what the show was about and how we would do it. And we had a story about a place that some of you may know, it's not far away, the Al Ringling Theater uh, in Baraboo, Wisconsin, that Ringling gave to his hometown uh, to thank them for their support in 1915, an early movie theater. Now, the manager wanted to know if this was the first movie palace. And this led to a conflict in the production crew between me and the director. Um, she liked this man in Chicago who said the first movie palace was the Chicago Theater. And she found, because the building is so gorgeous, she found that a compelling answer. And I said, but wait, architectural historians would say there were several small theaters, including the Ringling in 1915, that made themselves be glorious, in which the idea of, of a palace, literally a European palace as a model, meant that these were buildings that gave a cachet to the movies at a point when they were looked down upon as being Nickelodeons. So we agreed to film two different endings and we would then take it back to the, uh, to the producer of the show. And so we did hers and then she said, cut. And I said, wait, wait a minute, <laughs> we're supposed to film this other ending. And she said, no, I'm the boss, we won't. And everyone had to listen to her. So I learned a very important lesson <laughs> that, that when you're doing any kind of work, you have to make sure that you 
can find a way of taking up these contradictions and realizing that sometimes people don't want you to have another point of view available. So I have never allowed something like that to happen again, but I'm telling you the truth about the show because it was the first show in American television to have the history and not the drama be the basis of what we were doing. Um, and I didn't realize. She thought it was more dramatic to have the Chicago Theater be the edge. And we had to come back and fight about that, and they refused to, to redo it. Uh, but it points out the ongoing nature of these controversies about the past or the present. Now, the humanities are there for a way of challenging this idea of we're going to separate fact from fiction. Um, facts are crucial, and so is chronology, but all facts are not equally accurate or relevant. And more important, we live in a world in which myths and fictional ideas have a great force. After all, myths about religion and race and nationalism have had a powerful effect in human history. Um, this was a crucial aspect of one of the most poignant segments I ever filmed. It was about a place called Angel Island in Northern California. It was a detention camp for would-be Chinese immigrants a century ago. Um, they were interrogated here, sometimes over months, and many of them bought someone else's identity when they were back in China. They would buy the identity of someone who had family in San Francisco, and then they would, on the boat, memorize every detail of where was the pigsty in the village and what was the astrological sign of your great-grandmother on your mother's side, all of these things that might be asked of someone in the family uh, by one of the, of the officials and then of them. So they would have to have all those answers. And they were so despairing about the future ahead of them, so frightened by how many of them were turned back, that they wrote poems of despair on the wall in this building. So it's a remarkable place that gives us a sense of the history of immigration, and of the ways in which sometimes there is deceit. Sometimes there are myths that people make up. And yet, I can only have a great deal of respect for these people who wanted to come here and who were determined uh, to have an opportunity. Many of them didn't even tell their families about the ordeals they faced and sometimes not even the reality of their multiple identities. Now, value is another key concept in humanistic scholarship. It's essential that we keep emphasizing cultural and intellectual value. History Detectives is different from Antiques Roadshow, even though two of my colleagues on the show come from there. They're appraisers. They're used to saying the value of this is $200 or $250. And I can't quite understand how they could be so precise because the market, in fact, it does change. But I want to emphasize intellectual and historical value. And yet, to acknowledge with that that the ways that the market or the economy function are constantly changing. That this was one of the, uh, of the most fascinating examples of, of early American history. It was a, 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 a bill put out by the Continental Congress in January of 1776. A bill that was put out not only before the Declaration of Independence, before we had declared ourselves a free nation, but we were therefore producing currency already. But it was also a bill when there was no money in the treasury. <laughs> Nothing at all. <laughs> and uh, in fact, it made it be very difficult for these soldiers uh, that this $6 bill was a month's pay. And within a year, you couldn't buy a pound of butter with it. Um, so we see again a long history of declaring the value of an object uh, and yet seeing the precariousness and wondering what was the intention, what was the knowledge behind it. Now, in terms of value, I can also have investigations of the value of architecture. In this instance, it's a story that I really enjoyed about a, uh, a delightful couple in Firestone Park, which is outside of Akron, Ohio. And they had heard conflicting stories about whether their house 
was a Sears house from one of these uh, books that had designs and then Sears would deliver uh, the uh, materials and you, or working with a builder, could produce a house very quickly and cheaply. Um, but as soon as I saw it, I could tell that an architect had designed this house. It was just too well done. The massing, the plan, had small spaces that really worked well. The interior was a very smooth way of, of proceeding through this space. And yet there were serious materials. And then we discovered that what had happened is an architect based in New York named Frederick Ackerman, who did working class housing, often working for uh, large companies. And in this case, Firestone Rubber was building housing for their employees to keep them from going on strike. Uh, and he couldn't get a local builder to deliver the materials for two years. Uh, and so they went to Sears and had Sears deliver the materials, which explains why you have this, uh, uh, this double story. Now, value is a key concept in, uh, in architectural history, but also in, uh, in the humanities. It's based on a way of thinking about knowledge that is cumulative and ongoing, but often has gaps. There are ways in which we, we often go to people and say, I can't give you the answer to your story. I can tell you this much, but I can't answer the question that you had. Um, let me give you an example of this. Here is um, a certificate, a stock certificate from 1892 um, that was fascinating. I thought it was ridiculous. Why were we even doing this story? It was 1892, a company who were made up of thousands of heirs of uh, six families who had been given the land that was most of Harlem uh, in uh, 1666. Um, and they were claiming, despite the fact that thousands of other people now own this land, that it was theirs because it had been given to their forefathers in perpetuity. I thought, well, yeah, that's ridiculous. If people own land, they own land, and it's too bad what happened in the past. And I went to, did a, a lot of investigation, and then finally went to um, this young man, Jesse Keenan, who was a former student of mine, and he's a legal scholar, and said, can you figure out what happened? I can't find any records. And he discovered that, in fact, by the way the law works then and now, the courts had acknowledged the legitimacy of the claim saying that they were obligated to try to understand the principles of the original uh, um, owners of this land. They were trying to understand what had been this first instance. But as he said, I can't find any decisions. And his speculation was that they realized if they'd said all of this ownership of property of the present day means nothing and we'll go back to whoever first owned the land, it would have caused total havoc. And so they chose to make a statement but not issue a legal decision. And this became, I think, a very important issue in this day, at this time, as we're dealing once again with the precariousness of what we as Americans think is stable. Property ownership, uh, the way that land is divided up, it is not nearly as uh, definitive as what uh, we presume. Now, this takes me to my last example, which is what we as scholars sometimes call otherness. That is, how do we try to sustain several different things at the same time? Um, it's helpful that the stories are each one both celebratory and critical. Admiring brave individuals makes it easier to confront the disturbing reality of prejudice and deceit, or simple foolishness that here is um, a house that uh, Thomas Edison designed in concrete, uh, and a young man wanted to know if his had been like that. And I discovered that the reason Edison, this brilliant all-American inventor, had designed a house in concrete, a house that had nothing to do with the potential of what concrete can do, was because he had invested in all of this machinery to crush rocks, and that didn't work, so he wanted to crush rocks to make concrete, and then had People in his staff designed concrete pianos and furniture and houses <laughs> as a way of trying to recoup his investment. Um, so it revealed the fallibilism of Edison. So let me just end by saying I love doing this show. And 
it raises to me important issues about how we ask questions about the past and about the present. Architecture, I think, is a fascinating medium for this amalgam of beauty and intellectual change. And I, too, encourage all of you to get involved with the Society of Architectural Historian, an organization that's based here in Chicago and that takes up these extraordinary range of buildings that you have here. Let me give you a little test, OK? There's one building on the screen that is not in Chicago. <laughs> Who can figure out which one it is? Or at least take this on. You can't. No, you didn't have your hand up. That's OK. But you just can think among yourselves. It's one of the challenges, I think, to pose ourselves. What are the things we're familiar with? What are the things that are surprises? What are the different ways that we can tell a building that is a house for what group? A building that is a bank, a building that is a school, a building that is um, contemporary, or that is a hospital that's now endangered. All of these are ways of our looking more closely at the world around us and realizing these multiple overlapping stories. Uh, it's a part of scholarship and it's a part of ordinary life. And I'll end with giving you a sense of my excitement about the breadth of people who engage these questions about the built environment and about history. I had a wonderful day now six years ago. In the morning, I got an email from a friend who teaches at Princeton, who has a chair in Renaissance literature and culture, the epitome of the highest of the humanities. And he said, I love watching your show uh, because it shows how historians think and how we work. And that afternoon, I was walking down the street, and an 18-wheel truck drove by, and the truck driver leaned out his window and said, hey, history detective, I love your show. <laughs> so I hope all of you feel the same way, and I thank you. <laughs>